Schumacher was president of the Soul Association uh, between 1970 and 77. Uh, and in 1971, um, he, made the, uh, he wrote an article for our magazine, Living Earth, uh, which made the case for the practical application of economic and organic thinking into practical and lived experience. Um, I'm just going to give you one quote from him, which has resonated with us down the ages. Um, Let us not defend a type of pristine virginity to remain a little esoteric splinter group at a time when the whole world is crying out for precisely the kind of thinking uh, that the Soil Association has been engaged in for the last 25 years. Uh, now that, um, that quote uh, is just as relevant uh, for us today uh, as it was uh, in 1971. Uh, and we wrestle with it all the time. You know, how do we stay true uh, to our organic principles, uh, our care, fairness, ecology, health, and uh, stay focused on a vision of the world that we want to, to see. But how do we do that and also reach out uh, to everyone to help many more people uh, make the first steps uh, towards that vision, uh, to speak in a way uh, that will resonate and encourage rather than alienate and, and exclude. And we're really aiming as an organization to do that uh, with uh, much of our work today. Um, in our work with farmers, um, we are both uh, supporting and aiming to improve organic farming systems and increase the amount of organic farming that's going on, of course. But we're also increasingly sharing what we're learning uh, with non-organic farmers too, because we really do need to transform the whole of the way our farming is done in this country and overseas. Uh, the, you know, the challenges are so huge that we just can't do it uh, through you know, being that pristine uh, three percent of land use, we need a hundred percent of our land to be farmed in a much more sympathetic way. And we're doing that uh, through supporting farmers as innovators. Um, we've got a great research program uh, with the Organic Research Centre, um, funded by Dutch Originals, uh, which actually um, helps support them in their experimenting and puts a researcher in place. And we're doing that through our animal welfare work, with working with RSPCA and with Bristol University, uh, and sharing what we're learning uh, through what we call welfare outcomes with all of livestock farmers. And we run a lot of core campaigns, um, with, like you know, the work we've done on antibiotics over the last 20 years, that's in the press this week, uh, on neonicotinoids, and uh, we'll, go, we'll be talking a lot about glyphosate very soon, about mega farms and, and about <coughs> soils. Soils are obviously right at the heart of what we do. Um, and all of those campaigns and all of that work uh, is as much about trying to transform uh, the, the whole of agriculture as it is about uh, just promoting uh, what we do as organic farmers. And I'm really happy, uh, I'm happiest when I'm talking about our farming work um, because I'm a farmer, as you've heard, um, but I want to go a little bit out of my core comfort zone today. And I want to tell you a story um, about how a small acorn of an idea, uh, a campaign we launched 11 years ago now, uh, has grown into a really dynamic force for change, and that's the story of our Food for Life program. Most great ideas start with a few uh, special people, and it was the case uh, with Food for Life. Two people here, Jamie Oliver, you'll know well. I hope you know Jeanette Ory too. She was the uh, school cook uh, who wrote the book, The Dinner Lady, who lobbied the Soil Association to start thinking about school dinners and how we could really enhance the well-being of future generations by getting our act together on that. So this is the book uh, that launched a school food re revolution. And this is our first report. We were joined by Lizzie Van, the Organics Children's Food brand, um, and she sponsored our first report uh, into Food for Life. We started a pilot in just five schools uh, about 10 years ago. We had endorsement from our royal patron, that's always helpful. And we began to make the case uh, for how good health uh, could be supported uh, through better nutrition in schools and how we could combine that uh, by supporting a better environment um, through good food. So bringing together uh, nutrition and environmental care into school lunches. 
So what's the Food for Life programme all about? Um, it's basically about food education. It's about getting kids involved in cooking, uh, in growing, uh, within the school um, premises, caring for animals. These, ch these children uh, have chickens, and a number of the schools we work with do have chickens. Some have more than chickens. Um, and actually, caring for animals is such an important thing for kids to do. They start caring for animals, I think they start caring for each other a bit more too. We get them visiting farms, uh, and importantly, of course, we try and really improve the food uh, that's on their plate. We work very much in partnership. So the Food for Life partnership was established uh, seven, eight years ago now uh, with Garden Organic, uh, with the Health Education Trust, Focus on Food, who do all the cooking work, and in the last couple of years with the Royal Society uh, for Public Health. So it's always been uh, very important to have a number of other partners involved with the programme. But having got going, having uh, made a bit of a start, um, they, we were immediately threatened uh, by government cuts. Sound familiar? Um, and uh, the return of the Turkey Twizzler was our kind of riposte to these cuts that were uh, slashing their way through the embryonic work that we and others were doing. But the lottery came to the rescue and uh, they decided to back the program and they backed it not just once uh, but twice. Uh, so over seven years the lottery backed Food for Life uh, we're just coming out of lottery funding now, and over that seven years, uh, we enrolled over 5,000 schools. That's over 20% of children in school in England. Uh, we awarded over 800 schools at either bronze, silver, or gold. And we also launched the Catering Mark, uh, which has been an amazingly powerful vehicle for change in itself, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on. So by the end of phase one, which was two years ago now, uh, we did a major evaluation. And that evaluation, uh, which was done independently, uh, showed that over 48% of families were reporting higher consumption of fruit and vegetables at home. So you know, one of the points of the programme was influencing children in the schools, we were also in influencing their families and their communities. But for every one pound spent uh, by improving school meals, by buying more locally, uh, that was bringing three pounds into the local economy. The 28% more children were eating their five a day uh, once they'd been through our flagship schools. This is an evaluation on the initial 180 schools that we were working with. And that school meal uptake uh, was up. And that's crucially important because the economics of school food meals means that we ca caterers can afford to put better quality food on the plate if they can actually get more kids eating the meals. Um, so if we, if we can get those economies of scale, more kids eating the school dinners, we can afford them to improve the quality of the ingredients that we're putting out there. And this evaluation really helped us make the case so that now we are being commissioned by local authorities, uh, by city councils, to roll the programme out um, across regions all over the country. Uh, we have 15 commissions uh, across the UK, and we've already com completed uh, seven or so already. So um, this is, I hope you like the cap. Uh, this is a compulsory issue for Food for Life children. Um, one of the key aspects of the programme too is to really emphasise the importance of kids eating together. Eating on proper crockery rather than flight trays. Eating with their teacher at the table, having a conversation. You all know in this room how important, how civilising eating together is and how much, anecdotally, we didn't evaluate this first time around, how uh, important that is for attainment, uh, the holy grail for schools. We're getting great reports from teachers about how much calmer their kids are having had a decent, uh, decent lunch. And, uh, and we are really, really delighted that Ofsted have, over the last few weeks, announced that they're going to be evaluating themselves uh, the food culture and food education of uh, the schools uh, that they inspect and that's going to really help us embed the program it's going to give food for life the opportunity uh, to be seen by teachers as a real help to them in achieving um, uh, an outstanding or, or good uh, Ofsted rating so in food for life schools what does good look like um, I'm just going to talk you through uh, some of the features of some of the schools that we work with uh, working at bronze uh, silver and gold so this is a bronze school, uh, 
Drink Houses Primary and York. The school lunch becomes really central uh, to the school day. This is a very mixed community, and food is a really key plank for them to bring the community together, uh, to encourage the whole of the, 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 that quite disparate uh, social spectrum to come together around food. Uh, they get involved in farm visits, and, uh, and they have a school allotment. And they also do things like um, visit uh, the local windmill to source flour for their cooking. This is a silver uh, school, Eastfield Primary. Um, they are again in an area of high social need. We often find that Food for Life is particularly sought after um, by councils and by schools who have big problems uh, or where they have real challenges. And that's great because I think food is a healer. Food is a way of actually uh, enabling uh, some really important changes to take place. They've created a working farm uh, to improve attendance and attainment. And they uh, got so enthused that they achieved bronze and silver within a year of each other. Pupil voice is really important. Uh, the chance for children to shape their own world, to have a say in things and to be heard properly, that's a really important Food for Life principle. Um, and they get involved in, uh, in discussions about the menu, uh, in, in designing their growing activities. Uh, so many opportunities for children to do, uh, to do more and have a greater say. And uh, one of the things that a lot of the schools do is run a, a, a food farmers markets, uh, which can be um, farmers coming in and selling in the school and, and creating some income actually for uh, their programs and, act and activities. But often it involves the kids themselves uh, making things, growing things, um, and selling them uh, at, those, uh, at those events in the school. And that's, I love that because I think it's creating entrepreneurial children who are weighing and measuring and working out the margins. I'm, I'm very keen on all of that. And just taking you into a gold school, this is uh, Howarth Primary in West Yorkshire. Uh, this was a school that was in the bottom 5% in 2006 and went from the bottom to the top 5% in 2012. And Janet Parkinson, who was the amazing head teacher there, always gave Food for Life great credit for helping them achieve that, that real transformation uh, in what they do. Um, they have a really great system of taking their, their produce, their growing stuff, and then they're getting it into the kitchen. Uh, and as I say, uh, children are very much shaping the menu. Um, yeah, on the right side, good. Too many bits of paper. So at gold, um, at gold level, and gold is really tough. Uh, you know, there aren't that many schools still that have made it to gold. We expect the schools to be real ambassadors um, for good food in their communities. It's not just about what's going on in the school, it's about taking that out of the school into the community. There's usually lots of partnerships with, uh, with uh, local stakeholders. Maybe that's old people's homes. Uh, we like to, you know, we're very keen on trying to bring the older generation to the schools to actually be with the kids and spend time with the children at, at meals. Getting parents involved, parents are often working evenings to help develop the raised beds and all that kind of stuff. And uh, to be able to really demonstrate uh, the impact that the approach is having on community health. At Goal, it's about really embedding what they do so that it lasts, because the key thing with this program is that we must make sure it, it isn't just a one-hit wonder, um, but that it will resonate on down through the years. Um, and things like building uh, performance targets uh, into uh, all staff development plans is a really key way of trying to, to make sure we don't lose the benefits that we've developed while we're working intensely with those schools. So just reflecting um, in my final few slides on what are the factors for success um, in a school like this. Um, and a key thing uh, is that the head teacher needs to really lead the way. Often it's another member of staff who really sparks the thing off in the first place, but it has to be taken on board by the head teacher because unless it comes from the top as well as from the bottom, it's not going to work. So developing that, uh, that whole school uh, vision, uh, that cross-curricular approach, um, seeding it in in the right way, a head teacher is crucial. It's also vital that parents and pupils are properly engaged. For parents, it's often a really soft, a good way into the school for them. A lot of parents in the areas we're working in 
have had really negative experiences at school themselves, and they find it hard to engage through some of the more conventional routes. Uh, coming in through food is often a way to, to allow them to get, engage it, uh, with the school uh, on terms that uh, feel more comfortable for them initially. And as I've mentioned before, that focus on the pupil, respect for their ideas, um, and making sure that their ideas are actioned, building an enterprise culture in that school. And the catering staff, you know, it started with a dinner lady. And uh, one of the things that we recognize really early on is just how undervalued catering staff are. You know, actually people who work in food are across the board, but dinner ladies uh, don't get a lot of airtime, uh, or they didn't until Jeanette came along. Um, and involving them properly and really putting them centre stage uh, is crucial in, in terms of selling the, the food into the children. And this isn't easy. Um, actually, for a lot of, the, lot of the, the, the cooking staff we've worked with, uh, they've had to learn a lot of new skills. And sometimes they've been trying to deliver a lot more in terms of all this fresh, freshly prepared food in the school with perhaps not enough budget to do it properly, feeling under pressure to do things from scratch when they've previously just sort of pulled it off the Brakes Brothers van. So there's some really big changes and they need a lot of support and training uh, to be able to do that. But once they get there, once they are properly involved in the program and uh, are cooking food that the kids are loving, uh, the morale of uh, the catering staff uh, is immensely improved. Now I mentioned earlier on uh, that we're exiting from the lottery grant at the moment. And over the last few years, as part of that, as part of thinking about what the future of Food for Life looks like, we developed a catering mark. Um, and this uh, is about, it's not, not the education piece, it's the bit which is about the food on children's plates. And so again, we've developed a bronze, silver and gold approach, uh, which allows uh, the, the, the food to be dramatically improved. And over the last uh, three years or so, the catering mark has gone from strength to strength. Um, so we're now uh, serving nearly 1.2 million meals uh, every day in term time, which is an extraordinary achievement. That's going into about 7,200 schools, uh, 291 nurseries, over 24% of universities have now applied for or achieved the catering mark. It's in care homes, uh, it's in hospitals, I mentioned that already, no I haven't. Um, and uh, and the, the really exciting thing about it is that once uh, these institutions get involved, they don't stop at bronze, they go to silver and gold. 59% of all the meals now served are at silver or gold standards, and that means they've got organic food in them uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. And for us, that's crucial, normalizing organic food uh, in all those places where people are eating uh, is a really important thing for us to do. So that's been a huge success. Um, and finally, this is Jeanette getting her MBE, so it was all worth it. Um, and uh, a load of children uh, got uh, much better food and a much better understanding of where they, their food come from. Uh, there's still loads more to do, uh, but I hope this has just given you a flavour of why I'm so excited about uh, the work that's being done on Food for Life. Thank you.